Okay. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Danielle Piomelli, our uh, keynote speaker today uh, for this morning session. Um, it, it is not an understatement to say that Dr. Piomelli is a pioneer in the science of cannabis. Uh, it is our great pleasure to, to have you with us today. Uh, Dr. Piomelli is the Louise Turner Arnold Chair in Neurosciences uh, at the University of California, Irvine, uh, where he is also a distinguished professor. Um, he is the editor-in-chief of Cannabis and Cannabinoid Research, the only peer-reviewed journal entirely dedicated to cannabis. He directs the NIDA Center of Excellence at uh, UC Irvine and UC Irvine Center for the Study of Cannabis, um, and has published more than 400 peer-reviewed articles over the course of his career. He is uh, literally the most cited cannabis scientist, I believe, on Google Scholar. So uh, we are in very good hands for this session. Thank you very, so much for joining us um, at uh, our session today. Thank you for having me. I assume you can all hear me, right? So I was, again, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I was tasked today to um, introduce you to um, the endogenous cannabinoid or endocannabinoid system, which is, as the presenter alluded to, the uh, uh, something I've been working on for a while. Uh, and I understand the audience is not um, only made of scientists, there are also uh, folks from other walks of society. So I will try and um, stay on, on a certain level of, uh, of, uh, of language, if you wish. Uh, please do uh, let me know if anything is, is unclear. So uh, here is the protagonist of my talk. That's, of course, the cannabis plant here, the inflorescence of the plant and the, the female, the, sorry, the leaves of the female plant. And these are two uh, of the many different avatars that the, uh, uh, the cannabis as a drug has taken over the millennia. This is, of course, marijuana, which is what is most, uh, um, <clears throat> what cannabis, uh, how cannabis is most commonly used in, in um, the American continent. And here is ashish, which is uh, uh, more common in North Africa and, and Europe. And, um, I like I like to start off by um, in, maybe going through um, a little bit of the history of uh, of this of this fascinating medication medicine plant, which uh, in has of course is very very long as I'm sure all of you know. Uh, humans have been cultivating uh, the cannabis plant for over eleven thousand years. Uh, there, there's very strong archaeobotanical records for its presence in Europe, in Japan, and in Asia, other parts of Asia, uh, since the, uh, before the Neolithic. So it is clearly, um, it is clearly a very, very long um, relationship we had with this plant, but we began in earnest to study it scientifically uh, in the mid of the 19th century. And that happened when this gentleman here, Jacques uh, uh, Joseph Moreau de Tours, who was a French psychiatrist working in the uh, Santan Hospital in, uh, in Paris. He wrote this uh, uh, truly fantastic uh, uh, book uh, entitled uh, Le Chiche de l'Alignation Mentale, which uh, could be translated loosely into English as Cannabis and Mental Disorders. is a wonderful book, and I do recommend uh, those of you who are interested reading it. There is there are multiple translations, certainly there is one in English you, you, you can acquire, and it gives, uh, at least in my opinion, the first uh, solid uh, description of the pharmacological properties of, uh, of cannabis, specifically its psychotropic uh, effects. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, elsewhere in, uh, in Europe and in the United States of America, people started to uh, study uh, the plant and uh, what you see here is the front page of a dispensatory, which is something like uh, um, a pharmacopoeia. In fact, is a commentary on the pharmacopoeias of the uh, UK and United States, which was uh, authored by Robert Christison, a pharmacologist, uh, a Scottish pharmacologist, who uh, also described, uh, this is a 1848 book, uh, 
also describes the, uh, the uses of the plant, along with other new additions to the pharmacopoeia, one of which was chloroform. So uh, we have, as a medicine, cannabis has been used actually for in Europe for a while, and actually its usage uh, continued pretty much unhindered un 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 from 1845 to 1942. Um, that's the year, 1942 is the year in the United States, cannabis was withdrawn from the pharmacopoeia. In Britain was actually a little bit before, I think, was I think in 1937. But uh, until then, you know, in any pharmacy of uh, uh, Europe and, and uh, in the Americas, one could find such something like this, this uh, extract, for example, of cannabis, this is a cannabis grown in America, so cannabis Americana, uh, which was sold by a company called Park Davis. Then in 1937, something happened, and what happened was not um, medical, was no, there was no medical incident, there was no new discovery, but it was already political and deeply rooted in the politics of the time, these are the 1930s, and um, uh, there was a, a very strong push uh, against the immigration of uh, folks from, from Mexico, as well as from uh, Haiti and uh, other countries into the United States. And that led, uh, that led uh, to uh, the introduction of a bill which was passed into law by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt under the name of the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, which all but delegalized or illegalized uh, cannabis. Now, at the time, and I'm going to just say this, there is at least one possible uh, explanation for this very curious illegal, illegalization of something that was present, was found in every pharmacy. Um, and th the fact is that really we didn't know very much about cannabis in 1937. And the most important, the active principle. So the active principle in, in pharmacological jargon is the chemical constituent that is responsible for the effects of a, of a plant, right? Cocaine is the active principle of hydroxylone coca, for example. So the active principle of cannabis was unknown at the time, while by contrast, those of opium, coca, and you know, the, uh, the atropa leaf, et cetera, et cetera, had all been uh, discovered, it was actually this man here, Roger Adams, a very uh, productive and uh, important chemist in this history of chemistry, uh, who um, first, um, along with others, but he, his work is probably the most illuminating, he um, characterized the general structure of tetrahydrocannabinols. He, at the time, he wasn't sure exactly how many and what precise structure, but tetrahydrocannabinols out of the marijuana plant, as you can see here, spelled with an H, which was the pre prevalent spelling at the, at the time. So this is a, a very interesting lecture, however, Harvey lecture that he gave in 1942 in the middle of World War II. And if you ask yourself why in the middle of the war, well, because actually what had happened is that uh, as the war started, the, um, the United States uh, government decided to make temporarily cannabis legal because of course cannabis can be used to make, as hemp can be used to make fabric and, and textiles, uh, very robust, very sturdy textiles. Uh, and uh, so for a while there was this whole thing hemp for war and uh, that gave uh, uh, Adams the opportunity to actually study THC, study CBD. Now he, of course he was limited in his uh, uh, ability to make uh, uh, headways in, in this because um, many of the techniques that are now common in the lab were of course not available in the 1940s, early 1940s. So it took another 20 years, uh, now we're in, the mid, in the mid 60s, for this gentleman here, Rafi Meshulam, I'm, I'm so sure all of you know his name, he was born in 1930 uh, and still doing very, very well. I saw him a few uh, days ago and just doing terrifically. And in 1964, along with his colleague, um, uh, uh, Naomi, uh, uh, Gaomi, he, uh, um, uh, utilized a new technique known as uh, uh, spectrometry uh, by, uh, uh, to, uh, to precisely characterize the structure of THC. Uh, and what you see here is uh, really the, this is cannabinol to the right, this is tetrahydrocannabinol to the left. And the, the critical uh, 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 contribution he gave was the identification of the precise structure of this ring, particularly this this double bond in the delta nine 
or delta one position, depending on how you name this, uh, this ring. So that was a very momentous uh, discovery because then, uh, you know, the field uh, had uh, a chemical tool to study the, uh, the effects of cannabis in the body. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it did not immediately took off and the field was held back primarily by for one reason, which is actually chemical in this day. It is not political. And politics always played a role. It was so hard to, to study these things, such as stigma around cannabis. It still haunts us, by the way, but that's a different story. The one in a chemical issue, a chemical problem with THC is that pretty much every other um, bioactive component on plants until then had been uh, an alkaloid, which means basically a, an organic compound with uh, a nitrogen atom carrying a, sometimes a positive charge. And uh, what you see here, of course, is not an alkaloid. There is no nitrogen here. This is a terpenophenolic compound. So it's very hydrophobic. It's actually pretty, hydro, quite, quite hydrophobic. And so more lipid-like in structure. So it didn't fit with the general, uh, what scientists were thinking at the time. So progress was really slow in the 1960s and 70s and for a large part of the 1980s. But some progress was made and largely because of, again, social political reasons uh, in the 1960s, uh, cannabis among the certain components of the white population of America became popular. So it stopped being just a drug of the black population, of the brown population, but also now intellectuals started using cannabis, white intellectuals started using cannabis. And you know that already dealt spells trouble because right away people become, uh, you know, in, in Washington become very, very attentive. And uh, some, some cannabis, some attention was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, given to cannabis, but the progress in science remained slow. And again, there was a scientific problem there. The problem was that because this compound is not an alkaloid, doesn't carry a positive charge at any, under any circumstances, it's, and it, the idea prevailed that uh, it could work simply by inserting itself into neuronal membranes and causing some kind of a, uh, some kind of a perturbation of the neural cell membrane, changing the fluidity of the membrane. So people were uncertain as to whether there was even a receptor for, for, uh, for, for THC. Receptors such as those that have been discovered, for example, for morphine, which is of course the active principle of opium, uh, or cocaine, the active principle of coca, in the case of morphine, of course, are the opioid receptors. In the case of cocaine is, of course, the dopamine transporter. So these are these are things that bind to proteins in the body uh, and uh, THC was thought maybe it doesn't, maybe it just interferes generally with the membrane. Now that's, if this sounds like a weird theory, I think you're right, it is a little bit of a weird theory, but at the time wasn't completely, uh, it wasn't dismissed actually, it was pretty prevalent until uh, Aline Howlett and Bill Devane uh, showed up and Aline Howlett uh, is uh, uh, still, a very, very active scientist in the, in the field. Uh, and what they did, basically, they took membranes out of the rat brain, and what they found is that they could bind various uh, cannabinoid molecules, synthetic cannabinoid molecules, which the pharmaceutical industry had been playing with um, in the attempt of discovering new analgesics. So they basically, by using this approach, uh, which is now uh, pretty old fashioned, but still very, very important, um, they basically uh, came to the conclusion that there was a receptor. Of course, they couldn't say that there was a receptor, but they said it was a selective cannabinoid binding site in the brain. And so that paved the way for the discovery that was made uh, two years later by Elisa Matsuda, who was then working in the lab of, uh, of Bonner, Tom Bonner at the, NIH, at the NIH, where they cloned a bunch of receptors and they discovered that one of these receptors, which they already cloned, was able to bind selectively THC and all these various analogs of THC the pharmaceutical industry had been making. So basically, this is the, the turning point for many people, because when you clone something now, you know for sure that is there, it's a protein, and uh, this is how it looks. At the same time, Miles Herkenham and others, at the, uh, always at the NIH, in fact, the uh, next door neighbors of uh, Tom Bonner's, uh, 
they discovered they used a probe, um, a radioactively labeled compound called CP55940, which is a highly potent uh, cannabinoid receptor agonist. Uh, and they, they could label it with tritium, so they could make it radioactively labeled and use that to localize cannabinoid receptor in the right brain. And I'll show you a, a slide from that paper. It's a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous slide. It's actually one of the reasons uh, why I entered the field. So a few years later in 93, uh, a second cannabinoid receptor was cloned, the CB2 receptor. And now uh, what you see here, the schemes here are not really the receptor, it's just sort of artistic renderings of them. But uh, CB1 in particular has been crystallized. We have a lot of information about its structure. And of course, for many, for several years now, for quite a few years indeed, they've been, uh, these receptors have been studied and we know a lot about them. So these are classical transmembrane receptors. So they, they go back and forth through the cell membrane seven times. They are coupled to these intracellular proteins called G proteins, which uh, allow them, allow the receptor to signal, uh, to produce intracellular signaling, to start intracellular signaling. These are GI slash O proteins. And um, uh, there is also a non-GI geoprotein uh, um, uh, signal transduction mechanism. So a very rich repertoire of intracellular transduction mechanisms. CB1, CB1, which was the first receptor to be cloned and also the one that uh, Aline, uh, Howlett, uh, Aline Howlett, Howlett and uh, Bill Devane uh, originally characterized is present in the brain in very, very large numbers. In fact, is the single most abundant uh, G-protein coupled receptor in the brain, uh, 12 times more abundant than mu opioid receptors, four times more abundant than the dopamine D2 receptors. But uh, don't be fooled, the receptor is also present elsewhere in the body. In fact, there are very few organ systems where we don't see the receptor. Peripheral neurons have CB1 receptors, specifically in various uh, uh, cellular subtypes, but even cells where you would not expect the receptor to be, for example, adipocytes or hepatocytes. Adipocytes, of course, are cells in the white and brown adipose tissue. Hepatocytes are cells that make up the, the majority of the, of the liver parenchyma. These are also expressing low levels, but functionally important levels of the CB1 receptor. Now, the CB2 receptor only has about 40% homology with the CB1, which is really unusual. Usually, receptors of, of the same class have a, large, have a greater amount of homology but they are also very different in their localization. They're predominantly expressed in cells of the immune system, such as macrophage B lymphocytes. And for, because they're present in macrophage and private macrophage are present everywhere in the body, CB2 is also present in the body. So one thing you need to take from this slide, the message you need to take from this slide is that whenever someone uses cannabis, whenever someone has THC in their bloodstream, that THC is going to activate receptors throughout the body. So don't please don't think about THC as an exclusively uh, psychoactive drug. It, it is actually a very uh, a, a systemic drug with systemic uh, effects. And here is a slide that I promised I would show you for those of you who are not into this stuff. This is a section of the rat brain in this direction. So we call it a parasagittal section. So this is the cortical mantle here. So this is the nose that would be here and the back would be here. And this is the cerebellum, the cortical mantle, the hippocampus. This is the, uh, 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 the substantia nigra and topodontal nucleus, pallidum and striatum. So as you can see, the darker, so of course, as the darker the, um, the image, the greater the amount of receptor. And uh, there is a ton of CB1 receptor, CB, cannabinoid receptor in the brain in areas that kind of make sense. Uh, it, this is a rat, but if you inject the THC in a dog, the first thing that happens, the dog loses equilibrium and falls over. And that's because of the cerebellum cannabinoid receptor, presumably. Another thing that happens, I'm sure some of you might, might have experienced it, is that under the influence of cannabis, it's very hard to memorize stuff. You have a lot of interesting mental activity, but not memorizing stuff is a lot harder. And that's uh, presumably because there is so much cannabinoid receptor in the hippocampus, which is you know, crit critical to, to the initial processing of, uh, of information. And the cortical mantle, of course, has a lot of cannabinoid receptors, which explains a bunch of stuff that uh, I personally found fascinating as a, as a very young man. 
uh, uh, starting to study uh, cannabis, you know, uh, I, 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 I figured why on earth do people laugh or when they smoke pot? Is that what does it, I mean, what is the, why is what they find something so funny that is not funny? I thought there was very, very fascinating. Again, one of the reasons why I became involved in this is the uniqueness of the effects of, uh, of this uh, really unique drug. And so in this scheme, you see the localization of CB1 receptors in the human brain, pretty much as you have seen it in the, in the rat brain. But here, what I wanted to point out is also pre uh, uh, locations where, or structures where the receptor is not present or is present in fairly low amounts. And I like to point out this particular structure here, the Predetzinger complex, which is located in the brainstem and is involved in the rhythm, the rhythm, the breathing rhythm. Uh, so there are no, there are very few CB1 receptors in Predetzinger complex. And uh, why, why do we care? Well, we care because there are instead a ton of mu opioid receptors, or rather, there are enough mu opioid receptors there that when uh, morphine uh, reaches them or another opiate like heroin reaches them, uh, the, um, the, ryth the rhythm the, that the neurons impose to our respiration unbeknownst to us, that rhythm is, uh, is stopped. So the main cause of, um, uh, of death in, um, in opiate overdose is respiratory depression. And that is, uh, caused by activation of mu receptors in the pre complex. There are no functionally important CB1 in pre so the, uh, the, uh, uh, that's probably the reason why um, uh, cannabis is relatively safe as a drug, acutely safe. By that, I mean, uh, it's very hard, if not impossible, to die of a cannabis overdose. Now, it, it doesn't mean, of course, that if you inject uh, a pure THC, you're gonna be fine. Probably not, but you know, with the the standard operating procedures for using cannabis, getting killed is extremely hard. You have to really make an extra effort. Whereas with opiates, it is unfortunately quite simple, and the same is true for other alkaloids like nicotine, for example, that is an extremely powerful uh, poison. So, what do these receptors do in the brain? We have a lot of them, and uh, uh, we have them everywhere. In fact, we have them mostly in terminals. So for those of you who are not neuroscience aficionados, two neurons or neural cells communicate with each other through this, you know, structures called synapses. And what you see here is a synapse. A synapse is made up of one presynaptic component, which is here, and it comes from one neuron, and another postsynaptic component shown here that comes from another neuron. And in this case, this is a, a GABAergic synapse, which means that this presynaptic uh, neuron releases an inhibitory transmitter called gamma aminobutyric acid or GABA. And what you see here in yellow are, you know, in theory, molecules of, uh, of, of GABA. And GABA works by activating receptors on the postsynaptic uh, portion of the of the synapse, and you see here the GABA receptor, and that causes changes that inhibit the cell. You know, this could also be uh, an excitatory synapse. It really doesn't matter because there are CB1 receptors pretty much everywhere in the brain, and they are located pretty much right here. That is, you know, in the sort of ring uh, that is around the presynaptic, in a ring that forms around the presynaptic uh, nerve ending. Uh, not in the middle of the synapse, at the border of the synapse. And what happens is that when one activates this receptor, uh, this, these are G proteins. G proteins have Greek names, so alpha, beta, gamma. These are the beta, gamma subunits. And these uh, beta, gamma subunits go and do things. You know, they carry the message. In this case, they block calcium channels, and calcium channels are necessary for the process of neurosecretion because calcium triggers the secretion of GABA and other transmitters, including, for example, the excitatory transmitter, glutamate. So activation of CB1 receptors through beta-gamma closes calcium channels and the whole process of transmission is reduced and even eventually shut down. Now, CB1 receptors do also other things, for example, the open potassium channels and Again, for those of you who know physiology, the opening of potassium channels lets potassium out of the presynaptic uh, nerve ending. And that, uh, of course, hyperpolarizes, so increases the polarity uh, 
of the of the synaptic and makes it of the of the, of the synapse and make and makes the transmitter release harder. So basically, activation of CB1 receptors presynaptically uh, regulates in the sense that it decreases the release of neurotransmitter. And what you see actually here, you know, is not just the cartoon, but the actual the way it looks. This is an electron uh, microscopy image. Um, and uh, each of these black uh, black balls is a CB1 receptor. This is worked by Istvan Katona, who was at the Angara Academy of Science at the time, now is in Indiana. And so each of these is a cannabinoid receptor. Look, just count them. This is just one slice. You have to imagine this is a tridimensional structure. There's so many CB1 receptors, and this is a GABAergic uh, uh, interneuron, so an, an inhibitory neuron. Now, again, don't be fooled, as I said before, the fact there is a ton of CB1 in the brain doesn't mean that there isn't any anywhere else. And in fact, as I said, and I'm going to repeat myself, there is a lot of it also in other places at much lower density. And here are some examples, CB1 receptors, but also CB2 uh, are present in, uh, in white blood cells, for example, where they regulate immune response, in blood vessels, when they regulate vascular resistance and blood pressure, as we have learned from the work of uh, George Kunos, in the intestine, when they can regulate not just bowel movements, uh, which is also something the opioids do, but even absorption of fat and hunger through a vagal mechanism in the kidney, in peripheral neurons. So we have CB1 receptors and also a large amount of CB2 receptors pretty much everywhere. Why do we have a CB1 receptor? Why, why we have a cannabinoid receptor to begin with? Why would the body go through the effort of making a very expensive protein? Proteins are all expensive. You know, they take energy to be produced and put it on the membrane what to wait for what for us to get high clearly not so the, the that what's what, what scholars started to think scientists started to think was that there was there could be an endogenous cannabinoid system and this started with the uh, again with Bill Devane who uh, who had worked with Aline Howlett and then moved and went to work with Rafi Meshulam in Jerusalem where he pulled out from the brain of pigs this chemical compound which he showed which they showed bound to the cannabinoid receptor, the brain cannabinoid receptor. Um, work done um, in my lab uh, later on showed that a few, a few years later uh, characterized uh, how an anamide uh, was produced and degraded and characterized an anamide as a true neurotransmitter. It's not enough to show that something is in the brain. You need to show certain, there are certain very specific criteria. The compound has to be released under physiological conditions. It has to produce effects under physiological conditions. The right concentration has to be produced or the amount has to be produced. And then it has to be degraded. So this was work that spanned the 1990s from 94 to 1999. I'd like to point out uh, the efforts of, uh, of this uh, then young man, Andrea Chufrida, who is now Vice Chancellor at the um, University um, uh, of Texas San Antonio Medical School uh, and, uh, and others. So um, as anenamide was being characterized, um, uh, Jewish researchers in Japan and uh, Lumi Ranush and, uh, and uh, Rafi Meshulam in Israel uh, isolated another component from the brain. Uh, this time was the dog brain. Uh, in the case of Meshulam, the rat brain, in the case of Suyura in Japan. And this, this compound is 2-arachinoyl glycerol, or 2-AG for short, and they identified it as a ligand for CB1 receptors. Again, um, I actually became aware of this because Rafi wrote me a letter uh, with the structure of 2-AG, and I and, and worked on lipids all my life, so I knew what 2-AG was. And so it was fairly easy for my lab at the time I had a young postdoc who is now a professor at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle, an Stella, and he uh, and I uh, characterized 2AG as a neurotransmitter, demonstrated the pathways through which is produced and those through which is degraded. And these are the structure of the two compounds, anenamide and 2AG. Uh, anenamide is the amide of arachidonic acid and ethanolamine. Arachidonic acid is, of course, a fatty acid, is a lipid, just like THC is a lipid. Uh, and within uh, arachidonic acid has 20 carbon atoms and four double bonds all in the Z configuration. And 2 arachidonic glycerol is just like an anamide. It has the same arachidonic acid moiety, 
but instead of having amide bond, it has an ester bond, and instead of having ethanolamine, of course, has glycerol. So they're both agonists for CB1 and CB2 receptors, and endamide is a partial agonist, which means that it can never produce maximal efficacy, no matter how high the concentration of an endamide, the, the, the effect you will get will always be less than the effect you get with 2AG, which is instead a full agonist. And all these other guys here have been identified and isolated, but they failed to actually um, uh, meet the criterion of a transmitter, which is production of production, release, action at appropriate concentrations and rapid degradation. So let me talk a little bit about 2AG because it's the one, comp although it was the second uh, endocannabinoid, it's the one on which we actually have probably more information for some reason. So what does 2AG do in the body? I told you there are CB1 receptors all over the brain, and I told you they're all presynaptic pretty much. There are a few exceptions, but they're pretty much all presynaptic. So again, this is the presynaptic bouton. Here are the cannabinoid receptors in this sort of annulus or ringlet that is around the active zone of the synapse, which would be here in the middle. And uh, here is the postsynaptic spine. And now, so now this is a, an excitatory synapse. How do I know? Well, because it has a spine. Usually, presynapse, uh, no, usually, um, as a rule, spines are only present in excitatory synapses. Uh, inhibitory synapses have like flat land here. So what uh, 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 then postdoc now, so a professor in my lab did, uh, Kwan Mok Jung uh, showed that uh, the production of 2-AG is regulated through uh, activation, in this case of glutamate metabotropic receptors, which are located also in a sort of this perisynaptic region, this annulus again, this ringlet around the, the postsynaptic structure. So when glutamate is released, some spills over to this metabotropic receptor, which is connected tightly by, by proteins, the scaffolding proteins that actually link it to phospholipase enzymes and to other enzymes that produce 2-AG very quickly in large amounts of 2-AG by mass action, we believe, we don't know that for sure, we believe that THC by mass action is forced upon the presynaptic uh, bouton where it meets what? It meets the membrane, right? The first thing it meets is the lipid membrane. And for dopamine or serotonin, the lipid membrane is an obstacle, but for a lipid, the lipid membrane is a highway. So what uh, the, the lipid does enters the membrane, activates the cannabinoid receptors from the inside. That's where the lipid binding, sorry, the endocannabinoid binding site is located is within the membrane. And that causes an inhibition of transmitter release. So that is sort of a feedback mechanism and is really elegantly uh, organized in that not only there is this very elegant uh, localization of the uh, mechanisms, uh, the machinery necessary for the production of, uh, of 2AG, but there is also a perfect localization of the machinery involved in the destruction of 2AG. And again, let me remind you, if you, you don't have a signal, if you don't have a degrading mechanism, you, all, you have noise if you don't have a degrading mechanism. And uh, the enzyme involved in this is this guy here, monoglyceride lipase, MGL, uh, which was discovered many years ago, but we demonstrated is involved in, in 2AG degradation. And uh, Atia Gulyas in, in, uh, in, in Hungary, in our lab, in our lab, we show that MGL is presynaptic and actually lives in between the cytosol and the membrane. 50% of it is linked to the membrane. And what happens is that, uh, what we be what believe happens is that when, when 2AG uh, activates cannabinoid receptor, MGL is there and can convert 2AG into arachidonic acid, destroy literally 2AG because arachidonic acid has no affinity for cannabinoid receptors, and also is very quickly incorporated into membrane phospholipids. So this is a really clever, uh, elegant, I think, mechanism to regulate uh, transmitter release in an activity dependent manner, because the more glutamate you get here, the more this glutamate receptor will be activated, the more 2AG will be produced, the more 2AG produced, the more CB1 receptor activated. And the, then at that point you can stop because CB1 receptors typically stop transmitter release, right? And then here is the mechanism through which the whole thing is, is interrupted. Now this mechanism works pretty much in most synapses throughout the brain and spinal cord, and it regulates or mediates all sort of short, short and long forms of synaptic plasticity. So plasticity 
indicates the phenomenon by which a synapse changes over time. So let me say a few things about an anamide now. An anamide is a little bit more complicated. Um, uh, I, I, am, I think that an anamide is not a retrograde signaling signal, signal. Some people maybe disagree with me, but um, I still have to see the proof that an anamide actually works like 2AG. What I do think is that an anamide acts as a local modulatory signal, like uh, a peptide would act, right? So kind of a space uh, uh, or a volume transmitter, right? So it's produced in a place and, and diffuses around uh, uh, activating cannabinoid receptors around its site of production. And that is a local uh, modulation. And the one example I'd like to, uh, to show is one that is work of my MD PhD student, Don Wei, Don Wei was now at UCLA, where we show that basically social contact, which is so critical for old social animals, in particular social mam mammals, social contact activates neurons in the hypothalamus, in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus in particular, that contain a, a transmitter called oxytocin. Oxytocin is a peptide, and some of you have heard, uh, you know, you know it's, a, it's very important in love and, you know, sexuality and all sort of uh, cool stuff. Anyway, and also in social, social behavior, it promotes bonding, social bonding, and trust and stuff like that. So these, these neurons send projections to the nucleus accumbens, which is part of the corpus striatum. And there are cannabinoid receptors in the accumbens, not, not, not a gazillion of them, but quite a few, and they are on neurons. And so what uh, Don Wei discovered is that activation of oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens leads to the production of an anamide, which then diffuses to activate cannabinoid receptors and to actually mediate the effects of oxytocin. So if oxytocin produces social bonding, that effect uh, is decreased or even disappears if one interrupts the production of an anamide. So an anamide in this case appears to be uh, a, a sort of a, a signal that is engendered by oxytocin to effect an effector therefore of oxytocin function. And just like 2-AG, we have enzymes that make an anamide, and one of these enzymes is called NAEP PLD, doesn't matter what it means. Another enzyme called FA degrades an anamide when it's no longer needed. So if you, if you look back at these few slides and ask yourself the question, so what is different between the endocannabinoids and other transmitters, you can see right away what is different, right? If you have taken neuroscience in college or anything, or studied neuroscience in any, in, in any st st stage of your life, you know that transmitters don't work like this. Transmitters typically are stored in, in vesicles. They are accumulated in vesicles. They're released, as I showed you in previous slides, by, by slides by um, this neurocyclatory process, and they're recaptured and then brought back and put into back into the uh, into the uh, vesicle, so they're resynthesized and put back into the vesicles. That applies to pretty much every transmitter I know, with uh, two exceptions. One is the endocannabinoids, and the other one is nitric oxide a gas. But an anamide and 2-AG, the endocannabinoids are produced upon demand, and they're produced from, from first lipid precursors, and I'm not going to go there in big detail because it's too technical. But one point that I want to uh, make at this point is that uh, uh, when we look at the effects of, uh, of THC, we cannot uh, extrapolate them, we cannot then pull them away from the effects uh, of the endocannabinoid system, because the endocannabinoid system is literally the port of entry of THC in the body. The reason why we have, the reason why people seek cannabis, why 99% of the people use cannabis, uh, use it because of THC. And THC activates the cannabinoid receptors, and that has all sort of uh, all, all sort of effects on uh, uh, on the endocannabinoid system. Um, and um, THC, however, is not the only thing in cannabis that uh, interferes with the endocannabinoid system. Is certainly, I would say, the main thing. But for example, other components of cannabis, because of their structural similarity with uh, with THC. Um, also have some kind of interaction with the system. And one of them is cannabidiol or CBD, which is, as you all know, extremely popular these days. As you can see from the structure, cannabidiol does not have this ring. This in the middle ring here is gone. 
of the benzopyrene uh, ring is gone. There is an hydroxyl group here, double bond is produced here. Uh, and this molecule here has really very little affinity for cannabinoid receptors. That is, it's not, a, it's not an agonist for cannabinoid receptors, but there is evidence that it can modulate CB1 receptors. Um, uh, some folks believe, uh, and some data indicate rather, it's not a belief really, it's, it's, it's data, some data believe, uh, some sorry, some data indicate that uh, uh, CBD is an allosteric regulator of cannabinoid receptors, which basically means that it binds to a different site, to the site that is, uh, that is to which THC combines and regulates the binding of THC or the efficacy of THC or both. But CBD can also interfere with the enzyme FA, the enzyme that degrades an anamide. What it does, and unlike this arrow here, it does not activate FA, it inhibits FA, albeit fairly weakly, but this inhibition causes an accumulation of an anamide. So some of the effects of, of CBD could be due to this indirect uh, uh, inhibition of, uh, of FA activity. Um, so, uh, when we think about cannabis as a medicine, um, sometimes we forget that cannabis is a medicine already, that is THC is already a medicine. You know, we find it is, it is a FDA approved drug. It's been approved since the 1980s. It's just uh, under the name of Marinol. Uh, it's just not a very good drug because it's a poor pharma pharmaceutical, it's a really poor compound. So if you take it orally, it's got an all sorts of problems. But, but the, the, certainly the, the one thing that it does very well, it inhibits nausea and, and I think uh, uh, stimulates appetite. That's the famous munchies. But also there is very, and this is proven, this is, you know, from, is clinically demonstrated. However, what uh, we are almost, we have almost demonstrated, it's also that it inhibits pain. There are many papers out there. All of them have flaws because it's so hard to work with cannabis, but they all go in the same direction, suggesting that THC in particular in cannabis has analgesic or pain-killing properties. We are missing the, the critical uh, step. We are missing the critical experiment. We need a, a, a trial that allow, would allow us to say A or nay to this, but I don't know where we're gonna get it because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's politically so fraught of problems. And also from a commercial standpoint, uh, is hard to uh, uh, justify uh, the expense of a large trial for a compound that cannot be, uh, whose activity, intellectual property of which cannot be protected. Um, but the other compound that has actually gained in the last uh, five years, I want to say, a lot more popularity and has made a skyrocketing, uh, a skyrocketing trajectory in, uh, in, in medicine is CBD. And the reason for that is, uh, is mixed. There are some good reasons and there are some bad reasons, but be what it may, now CBD is uh, approved uh, as purified, highly purified CBD um, from, the, from the hemp plant, which is cannabis with very low levels of THC for the treatment of, of seizures. This is a drug by the name of Epidiolex by the former uh, British company GW Pharmaceuticals. Um, but CBD may also have other uh, uh, potential indications. There is very, very convincing, albeit not conclusive evidence that is antipsychotic and is devoid of the uh, side effects of classical first and second generation antipsychotics, such as sulpiride, for example, or uh, uh, other do dopamine D2 receptor blockers. And there is also evidence that is an anti-inflammatory compound when applied locally. Now, mind you, there are 400 uh, I'm sorry, there are 140, I, I multiplied in my head, there are 140 uh, cannabinoid compounds so compa in cannabis. Uh, the cannabis plant con contains about 140 compounds with this general terpenophenolic nucleus or some other similar um, structure. And so because of the similarity, it's quite possible that there are other uh, interesting uh, drugs and they're being actively explored. But of course, this is a gigantic, you know, cannabis in a sense, you can see it, you can imagine it as a, as a, a chemical plant, <laughs> using the word plant in the sense of uh, uh, industry. It's a, it makes so many interesting compounds and all have this interesting nucleus. So there is a lot of work to be done on those. So can we generate compounds using the endocannabinoid system? Yes, we can, uh, although we haven't really uh, 
uh, yet completely achieved this, but uh, uh, what you see here is a compound developed by my, my group in collaboration with chemists in Italy, Giorgio Tarzi and Marco Moore, is this, uh, uh, this carbamate uh, derivative, the, the biphenyl, decorated biphenyl group, a highly potent and selective inhibitor of the enzyme Fa. And we developed this 20 years ago. And uh, now there are Fa inhibitors uh, developed by many companies uh, and they're being tested for a variety of conditions, most of, interesting of which I believe is social anxiety as well as autism spectrum disorders. Um, again, the idea with the PHA inhibitor is that uh, when you block PHA, you increase the levels of anandamide. So you're boosting the effects of an endogenously produced molecule. You're not and the indiscriminately activating cannabinoid receptors. You're only activating those receptors that normally see anandamide, not to a G, anandamide. And uh, you're not completely uh, uh, activating the receptor, you're only activating it indirectly. And that, I think, is a very good therapeutic paradigm. And we can do the same with other enzymes of endocannabinoid uh, metabolism, for example, monoglyceride lipase. And the compound we see, you see here was developed by Ben Cravat. I, um, I gotta say that we developed the first MGL inhibitor, but this, is much, this compound here is much better. And now they have even better compounds than this. This, is a, this was a good, uh, a good probe, but uh, uh, we have much better compounds. And they're now being tested for a variety of conditions, including seizure, pain, etc. So I think I will stop at that. And um, I hope I didn't uh, go over my time too much. And uh, if there is time for questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Dr. Piamelli. That was a wonderful introduction to the endocannabinoid system. Uh, so now we will take questions uh, again. In the uh, Q and A section on uh, Zoom, please type in if you have any questions, or into the chat. We can also keep them there. First question from Liz: What do you think the role for intracellular CB1 receptor is, for example, on mitochondrial membrane? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, so there are uh, intracellular CB1 receptors that have been known for many years because the, every uh, G protein couple receptor has to be at one point internalized. And um, there is evidence that uh, uh, there are multilamellar structures, uh, intracellular multilamellar structure that contain CB1 receptors. This was something actually Thomas Freund discovered uh, many years ago. Now then, there has been uh, this idea that it could be uh, present on mitochondria and could regulate energy metabolism. I'm not a big uh, fan of this theory. Um, I uh, don't, I'm not sure really that there are really CB1 receptors on mitochondria. Um, those are very difficult experiments to do. Uh, and uh, the results that I've seen are not uh, such that I feel compelled to uh, believe them. Now, this said, I have no specific reason to disbelieve them either. So I am kind of uh, in limbo here. I'm suspended. So unfortunately, the answer to your question is I don't know. But uh, um, as often scientists need to do in these cases, uh, just say, mm, wait and see. If you have other questions, please type them in. So from Julia in the chat, uh, with 140 cannabinoids in cannabis, why, how is it that THC and CBD have been the most widely studied? Well, there is an easy answer for that is because um, the, the, the plant makes, hmm, the plant doesn't make THC and CBD, but makes their precursors, so to speak. The, kind of, the plant makes uh, acids, cannabidiolic and cannabinolic acid, tetrahydrocannabinolic acid and cannabidiolic acid in uh, large amounts, either one or the other. They come from similar, from a common precursor. Um, there are complex mechanisms or regulations that are beyond my understanding, but I'm not a botanist or a plant biologist, but uh, my understanding is that the plant makes either one or the other. And we humans have been selecting them for 
as I said before, 11,000 years. And guess what? We selected them to do uh, pretty much one thing, uh, either to produce uh, fabric, fabric, uh, so produce uh, 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 basically cellulose for textiles. And there was a very important uh, uh, reason. And when you do that, you don't have a whole lot of THC, but you have more CBD. Or we've used that to, to get high because that's uh, also pretty, you know, established in religious uh, uh, rituals uh, across the world. Uh, there are very many interesting stories that we could be talking about, but uh, to get to get high, so for the psychotropic effects, you need to to have THC, and so that particular uh, strains or cultivars, to be a little bit more precise, were selected for that. So we humans are responsible for making uh, the cannabis plant a THC making machine or a CBD making machine. In the case of uh, this THC making machine is because we wanted THC. In the case of the CBD making machine is because we wanted the fabric. The third thing that we wanted from cannabis was the seed, which are really tasty and rich in, in, uh, in, in oil. And I, my, my own personal suspicion is that uh, we started off eating them and then, you know, getting high by eating them, because in order to get the, to, the, to the seeds, you need to, or, or you, you need to touch the, uh, uh, the, you know, the inflorescence that is rich in, in, in CBD, in THC rather. So, um, uh, by the way, uh, one, one, one piece of information, why is it that uh, we have THC and CBD, but the plant doesn't make them? Because when the plant is dried, uh, which is of course is necessary for a lot of uh, activities, there is a decarboxylation that takes place, which is, which is catalyzed by temperature. So in the higher temperatures, say 100, 90, 80, 90 uh, centigrades, uh, the carboxyl group in, uh, in, in THCA and CBDA is lost into CO2. And now we are left with the active compounds. Great, thanks. Uh, next question from Tom. Uh, is there any data on what happens to 2-AG and anandamide in chronic regular users of cannabis? Are their levels changing as part of downregulation of receptors? And as a follow-up, what happens to their levels with cessation? Yeah, excellent question. And one that actually is being explored right now I have been a fund of this question for many years. I tried to convince, uh, you know, funders that something is in, should be studied, interested to find, to study, and not very successful at that. But um, again, we can we don't have a definitive answer for this. Uh, yeah, one would imagine that uh, the system should be shut down in the presence of a large amount of uh, THC. However, uh, I have not seen very convincing evidence of that yet. There are some, a lot of changes occur, especially after subchronic or subacute, say for a couple of weeks, self-administration or administration in animals in this case, we, we can see changes in the entire endocannabinoid system, um, but very little actually happening to, to a G and an anamide. Um, so I, I think that a little bit more, not a little bit, but a lot more research is needed to answer that question. But it's a critical question because we need to understand how, uh, uh, this phytochemist, uh, sorry, phytochemical uh, interacts with our own endogenous chemicals. And uh, to me, at least, is, is a critical component of understanding the, the biology of cannabis. Next question is from Tony George. Theoretically speaking, could a CB1R antagonist, like a safer version of uh, Ramona Band, be used to treat cannabis toxicity, such as cannabis hyperemesis syndrome? I don't think so. Um, so the, uh, the toxicity of cannabis is a, a real fact, uh, the, you know, especially chronic. There, there are two forms of uh, two issues with cannabis that I think need to be considered from a clinical perspective. One is the chronic use, especially in adolescents, and uh, chronic use in expecting mothers. I think those are two po two group of, two population groups that require our immediate attention. Um, and um, in in both in both cases, 
uh, there is a risk of long lasting uh, effects in one case on the individual uses in the other on the, the on the offspring on the on the individual uh, cannabis hyperemesis is um, something that can be fixed with a hot shower and uh, or with capsaicin patches so is it a real big deal um, you know it occurs um, I don't think it's such a big deal so I don't think it's worth uh, the expenditure of setting up a whole, you know, drug discovery program. Um, but uh, to, to, to answer the spirit of the question, so how use, would cannabinoid receptor antagonists be useful? Well, yes, the field since 1994, when the first CB1 antagonist was described by the French company Sanofi, the company that is now called Rimona Band, uh, at the time was at a different name, SR 1740 uh, uh, or something along those lines. Um, uh, Rimona band um, was tested uh, in a number of conditions. First of all, with schizophrenia. Don't ask me why. I really don't know why they came up with this idea, which I think was totally foolish. But anyway, so they tested in schizophrenia and then they moved to uh, a much better, much smarter idea, which was to, to look at the effects of, of uh, Rimona band in obesity and metabolic syndrome. And the reason why it's a smarter idea is because there are cannabinoid receptors in adipocytes, hepatocytes, and other peripheral cells that are involved in critical aspects of metabolic syndrome, including adipogenesis, in, in, uh, production of in, in, increase in, in fat mass, release of, uh, of, of lipids and, uh, and liver statosis. And in, in you know, the clinical trials were just, uh, uh, quite remarkable, the effects were remarkable. They're called RIO, Remonoband in Obesity Trials. There were several of them, uh, including thousands of patients. And the, on, on the area, it, it, it's efficacy, efficacy was never doubted. The compounds work beautifully. They decrease waistline, they improve the metabolic profile, wonderful stuff. However, uh, they get, the compound gets to the brain and does a couple of things that uh, we don't want because of the role of endocannabinoid system in regulating emotion and particularly our ability to cope with stress and to have uh, healthy social lives, as I sort of alluded to in my presentation. Um, uh, one problem that these patients had, there was a dose dependent uh, effect, the five and 10 milligram of, uh, of Rimonaban was increased irritability, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation and ideation. And all this of course led to the uh, lack of approval by the FDA in the United States and to the uh, withdrawal eventually after a short brief approval by the European Medi Medicinal Agency. So now the question is, can we leverage that? Uh, is there some value to it? And the researchers, including George Kunos at the NIH and others, companies, a few companies, really a handful, very few of them, have considered the possibility of developing peripheralized cannabinoid receptor antagonists, CB1 antagonists. And they had, there are excellent ones actually on uh, now. Uh, uh, and this these antagonists have been shown to actually have some of the beneficial effect of the cannabinoid receptor antagonist Rimonaband without the anxiety problems because it doesn't make it to the brain. So it doesn't, they don't have, they don't have that, uh, that side effects. Uh, unfortunately, companies are being very, very um, uh, suspicious about that. And that's simply because as you know, most pharmaceutical companies attach a label to something and then move on. So it's A or nay. If it's A, they will go doggedly at it until you know they lost a gazillion dollars. If it's nay, it's nay and they abandon it. Well, my hope is that someone with a little bit more foresight will, will take this because I believe that there is a lot of hope in peripheralized cannabis CB1 receptor antagonists. All right, uh, next question. Has your research group looked into the influence of terpenes on the endocannabinoid system and do they have any role in the mechanisms discussed today? Excellent question. Uh, no, my group has not looked into that, uh, but others have. Uh, uh, Ian McGregor, for example, in Sydney has done uh, some really important work and uh, Jonathan uh, Arnold also in uh, UC, uh, UC Sydney have done uh, um, important work on this. Uh, there is a huge brouhaha on the internet about this, and someone someone uh, has uh, uh, kidnapped uh, uh, Rafi Meshulam's expression, the entourage effect, uh, 
to say that there is an entourage effect caused by all these different chemicals and somehow magically all of them together do something that you know each of them alone cannot do now this is magic it's not it's magical thinking it's not science there is no evidence for this uh, and let me say it again there is no evidence for an entourage effect period um there are synergism there are antagonisms and terpenes could have a, a, a role in this, it will depend on what terpene, there are many of them, and in what concentration. So folks like McGregor and Arnold have been trying to do that. They've been trying to, in a, in a very controlled setting, in vitro or in vivo, have been trying to add terpenes and see how the primary response induced by THC was, uh, was affected. So far, the results have been mm, very disappointing. So I would say, Tentatively, but we are early in the game, tentatively, uh, terpenes uh, are probably not going to be very important pharmacodynamic regulators of the effect of, uh, of DHC. What do I mean by pharmacodynamic? I mean regulators of the pharmacological response proper. So what happens once THC binds to the receptor and causes an effect? Now, terpenes can, however, and will, however, affect other properties of uh, pharmacological properties, particularly pharmacokinetic properties, because terpenes are known for being able to increase, um, mostly increase the availability, bioavailability, the absorption of lipophilic compounds. Terpenes uh, uh, like lemonine, for example, are used to increase absorption through mucosal membranes. So it is quite possible that uh, the terpene composition of cannabis affects the uh, absorption of THC. And there is a, another important thing that terpenes do. Terpenes have smell, terpenes have flavor. And uh, sometimes we forget that we, uh, despite the fact that we're not really uh, olfactory animals, those things are really, really important. Um, and so sometimes the, the response that we experience, the response that people experience to cannabis, um, which is, as all we know, very different depending on, uh, you know, a bunch of, of different components, uh, um, personal and the product itself, that response could very well be affected by the smell, by whatever terpenes do uh, pharmacologically that is unrelated to, uh, to THC, but could contribute to that experience that uh, makes some of us say, okay, this is what I'm gonna buy when I go to the, uh, to the dispensary or I'm, st I'm sticking to this particular type of strain because it's good for me. So these are, uh, literally we're looking at maybe 50 years of research into this uh, because of, uh, of the sheer complexity of the, uh, of the chemistry of the plant and its interactions with our body. Great. We have two more questions. Uh, first one from Julianne. Uh, if blocking pho is a consideration that seems to be increasingly common or increasingly coming into play for patients with anxiety, how busy or active is big pharma in developing chemical remedies to do this versus using plant-derived compounds? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> Phi, Phi, you know, I, I happen to be present at conception here. So uh, Phi is, uh, um, you know, we discovered in 95, it's called the first inhibitor in 2002, the first useful inhibitor in 2002. And we discovered the, the anxiolytic effect in, uh, in 2002. And I've been watching for 20 years uh, the pharmaceutical industry messing it up systematically messing it up. Uh, they first picked uh, pain as an indication when uh, uh, it, it, I wrote back black and white my first nature medicine paper that there was a very little effect of, of uh, fine inhibition on pain and still because pain is a big commercial business, they decided to go for pain and not, not surprisingly they saw no effect that uh, chilled the spirit for some reason that I don't understand. Uh, then there was a pharmaceutical company in Portugal that developed a compound, uh, a fine inhibitor, in the attempt, I think, of selling itself to an American company for a better price, but uh, they are not in the business of making molecules. They should have stuck to whatever they are doing, they were doing before. So they created this uh, obnoxious compound that uh, killed the person. Uh, 
in France and, and crippled five more for life, it gave uh, serious neurological problems. And it was unrelated to fine inhibition because it was a terrible compound which they had, had really no business in, in putting into humans. But uh, that also chilled the, 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 the whole field. So for another five years, we were, <laughs> we were stopped on fire. So now finally, 20 years into this, 20 years after we said, look, you know, fine inhibition is good for anxiety. Now we, uh, we hear a lot of pharmaceutical companies, well, not a lot, some pharmaceutical companies, um, I won't mention names, but uh, it's, those are easy enough to find, to uh, uh, test it for social anxiety, uh, autism spectrum disorder, test finding, sorry, for social anxiety, autism spectrum disorder, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other such conditions. And the first indicators from human studies are actually quite, uh, are quite encouraging, encouraging underlined twice. You're not, we are not there yet, but it is my hope that after so much uh, uh, trouble uh, for so long, uh, finally uh, the industry has put its act together and do the right thing, testing uh, these drugs for the conditions which literally 540 preclinical papers were indicating because URB597, our fine inhibitor has been published 540 times, used by 500, in 540 different publications by hundreds of labs in the world and all pointing to one direction and finally looks like we're going there. Maybe it will work, maybe it will won't work. I don't really care to tell you the truth. I wish it worked because you know there are people with social anxiety and I want them to be better. But if it doesn't work, at least we will know it won't work. So we have set this aside, put it on, on the shelf and move on with our lives. So the, fi the, the fi inhibitor story, which I summarized here in, 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 in a few minutes is actually quite interesting. One could easily write a whole book on, on the entire thing. Next question as, uh, from Liz, as lipophilic molecules, how do endocannabinoids, phytocannabinoids affect membrane fluidity? And could me membrane fluidity changes potentially change CB receptor configurations? Yeah, we should never say no to things. So that's not something I'm gonna answer no to, not a question I'm gonna answer no to. Um, it's entirely possible. And one reason for that is uh, if you, instead of looking at membrane fluidity as a property of the membrane, in total, you consider membrane fluidity around specific proteins, around receptors. So receptors are su surrounded by this uh, ring of lipids, and it's uh, and that ring of lipids changes the can change the conformation, the flexibility, the rigidity of the receptor. You know, depending on the nature of the lipid. So it is not impossible that uh, at sufficient concentrations, THC or an endocannabinoid could uh, affect that, and that could be part of the response. However, uh, we know from uh, using standard pharmacological tools that uh, that does not explain the effects of, uh, most effects we see with other phytocannabinoids or endocannabinoids. So how do we know that? Well, because we can block those effects with drugs that selectively interfere with the receptor itself rather than with the membrane, or we can remove the receptor genetically and we see the effect of the drugs and the endocannabinoids basically disappear. So again, I don't want to answer no to this question because it's simply something that could be, as we study further, could play, uh, could be shown to play a role. But as of now, I think that the vast majority, if not the totality of the effects of phyto and endocannabinoids are mediated by the two G uh, protein couple receptors, CB1, and CB2. There are a few other receptors to which these compounds do bind in vitro and can bind in vivo if given at doses that are sufficiently high. One of them is the famous uh, vaniloid 3P1 receptor. However, I am not a believer that uh, we produce enough anandamide, uh, 2G doesn't bind to 3P1, but anandamide does. It, I, don't, I don't believe that we bind, we produce enough anandamide to activate the 3P1. So um, the answer to the question is, we don't know for sure, but likely not. All right, and one last question. We have time for one last one. Uh, 
It's from Tom, who's interested in the actions of oxytocin on the sense of well-being and socialization, and asks, do THC or CBD influence the production or release of oxytocin? I, I don't know. That's a very interesting question. I haven't even thought about it. I don't know if THC interferes with oxytocin. My, my thought, and this is simple, simply like really brain laziness, was that uh, um, because an anamide mediates at least some of the effects of oxytocin, um, then the prosocial effects of THC, which are very dose dependent, but have been shown. So the fact that a low dose is THC does improve um, sociability, um, uh, not a higher dose. <clears throat> I thought that was simply due to the fact that it was mimicking an anamide. But it's entirely possible that uh, THC could regulate, for example, through presynaptic mechanisms, the release of oxytocin from neurons in the paraventricular or supraoptic nucleus, uh, nuclei, which are, uh, of course, the neurons that produce oxytocin in the brain. That's an interesting question. All right, that's all the questions that we have. James? Hey, wonderful. What a uh, erudite lecture, Dr. Piamelli. It was uh, a pleasure to have you. I think that the winding history of cannabis research is uh, indeed um, sort of a parable of how uh, science moves in unpredictable ways. It sure is. <laughs>